Hi, you're now in Kids Corner. In this area, you will learn a lot of interesting facts and involve yourself in fun activities. Your choices for exploration include the following areas. One, story time. Two, fun activities. Three, baby animals. Four, amazing animal facts. Five, working with animals. Six, dinosaur friends. Seven, wild voices tour. And eight, name that animal sound. Remember, you can switch to any of these eight areas whenever you want. To find and begin exploring any area, click the running man at the top of the screen. Then choose the area you want to explore. You may also enjoy learning about animals in this welcome area. To begin exploring, click on one or more of the buttons below. and he is the only albino koala that's ever been born in captivity. There's only one other albino, and she is in Australia, and she was born in the wild. So he's a real special animal. Cheetahs are very sensitive animals. They're difficult to breed in captivity. We have approximately 12 acres here set aside for the cheetahs. The reason that the breeding program is important to the cheetah population is uh, cheetahs are an endangered species. They're very difficult to breed in captivity, and it's important to just keep the species going. The cheetah is the world's fastest runner, able to reach speeds as high as 70 miles an hour. But ironically, it's almost been overtaken by extinction, a victim of poachers after its beautiful coat, and significant loss of its habitat to human civilization. We've had one of the better success rates in the country. In captivity, as we're learning more about these animals, I think we'll be able to, to do a better job of reproducing them.
New arrivals are a major event at the zoo for the animals and people. This is the first day for these Chinese bears to be on exhibit. Now, as you can see, they're very anxious to make their debut here at the San Diego Zoo. They've been in quarantine for the past month. So you kids get out there and knock them dead, okay? It's taken about four years to get these bears here. Anytime you have a cub or a new bear is going to exhibit, it is very exciting. Whether they're new arrivals from afar or long-standing favorites, all bears are expert crowd pleasers. How old these guys might be? Well, how old these guys are. What can you do to help save resources that preserve animals and their homes? Here's a good idea, cans for critters, an aluminum can recycling drive that has been a big hit at the San Diego Zoo for more than 10 years. The money raised by school kids is no small pocket change. One year, the recycling drive raised more than $50,000. Who receives the money? The Zoo Center for Reproduction of Endangered Species, which conducts valuable research to save animals in danger of extinction. Sometimes, Cress's efforts to save a species are so successful that the animals can be returned to their native habitat. There's an important link between recycling aluminum cans and saving endangered animals. You see, aluminum is made from bauxite, a mineral mined from soil often found beneath rainforests. And living in the rainforest is a wide selection of animals, many of them endangered because the forests are being cut down. Endangered animals have a better chance of survival if the rainforests are left undisturbed. That's why recycling aluminum cans is important. The more we recycle, the less bauxite we'll need, and the rainforest homes of many animals will be preserved. Besides, think of all the other natural resources we use to make cans. Package them, color them, and transport them to stores. Cans for Critters teaches students how the can collection system works. An entire classroom can become involved, or people can participate by themselves. As an added incentive, the zoo offers prizes, like animal stickers, coupons for pizzas and ice cream, and free passes to the zoo and San Diego Wild Animal Park. Of course, you don't have to join the Cans for Critters program to recycle cans. You can start your very own recycling program.
Did you know that the energy saved by recycling just one aluminum can is enough to operate a television set for three hours? During one recent year, enough cans were recycled to save more than 11 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, enough to supply all the houses and apartments in New York City for six months. Perhaps even more amazing is the fact that people in the United States throw away enough cans each year to rebuild all the airplanes that fly our major airlines. Here's how you can make a difference. Whether you do the recycling yourself, join in with your classmates at school, or help with the recycling efforts at your workplace. A. Buy products with minimal packaging. B. Save cardboard boxes or paper and plastic bags for storing household items. C. Buy products like cleaners, toiletries, and dry goods in economy-sized packages. Consider buying your food in bulk. It'll save you money and reduce packaging waste too. D. Churn decayed organic materials from your yard in a mulch or fertilizer. E. Reduce your junk mill. That saves a lot of paper and trees. Just fill out a form at your local post office to remove your name from the third class mailing list. A class of students beginning a recycling program could follow these steps. A. Hold a school-wide assembly to educate your fellow students about recycling. Invite guest speakers, such as a recycling center director or a community leader, to talk about their activities. B. Submit an article about your program to the school newspaper and send a news release to local newspaper editors and to radio and television reporters. They may respond by publicizing your efforts. If you work in an office that's beginning a recycling program, consider the following steps. A. Contact your local collection agency. Its staff can help you plan your recycling program. B. Choose people in your office to coordinate your recycling efforts and to motivate others. You'll also have to figure out how you're going to store what you collect. Sometimes recycling companies supply offices with storage containers at no cost. Make sure everyone knows what kind of paper you'll be recycling. White only, mixed colors, or newspapers. It's a good idea to place small recycling containers around your office. These can be periodically dumped into a larger collection bin. Those are just a few ways you can get involved. Remember, each of us can make a difference. Yes, we can heal the earth. And recycling is one of the best and easiest ways to do it. How did the San Diego Zoo start? I always say that the world-famous San Diego Zoo began with a roar. It all started one afternoon in 1916. My brother Paul and I were in Balboa Park in San Diego, visiting the animals on there. Suddenly, I heard the lions roar in their cages, and I had an inspiration. Wouldn't it be splendid if San Diego had a zoo? I half-jokingly asked my brother. You know, I think I'll start one. Little did I know how prophetic my wish would be. In what seemed like no time, I'd convince city leaders and others to help me build a zoo. But sometimes important things take time, and I learned to be patient. Six years later, in 1922, my dream became a reality. From the start, I knew I had my work cut out for me. Do you know how many animals it takes to make a zoo? There could be bears, Lions, tigers, leopards, wolves, foxes, pandas, koalas, monkeys, gorillas, rhinoceroses, hippopotamuses, <gasps> zebras, camels, giraffes, bats, flamingos, hundreds of plants. And that's just the beginning. I felt like Noah trying to fill his ark. And of course, elephants were on the list. Everyone wanted to see them. But finding elephants in the early 1900s was no easy task.
The story of how we found our first elephants reminds me of the journalist who reported a UFO and then had to come up with one to prove it. In other words, I had told the public that they were going to get elephants, so now I had to do something about it. At first I thought that finding elephants would be easy. That's because the Cells Flato Circus was coming to town and its staff had offered to donate a pair. I was thrilled at the news. Finally, the great day arrived when my zoo project was to receive its first elephants. The mayor, our congressman, and a collection of other notable San Diegans were on hand for the celebration. Well, the horse act went splendidly, and the band played on, and on, and on. And that's when I began to worry. The elephants were supposed to appear after the national anthem was played, but there was no sign of them anywhere. A hush fell over the crowd and soon people began shuffling silently toward the exits. Everyone was numb with disappointment. Later, we learned that the circus staff had been too quick with their generosity. They shouldn't have offered to give away elephants they still needed. The following week, my hopes were raised again. My friend, John Ringling, owner of the famous Ringling Circus, was coming to town with his performers. One night during his visit, I told John about my search. He promptly called his elephant keeper and asked if their circus could spare one of its performers. There's Albert, the keeper said. Albert, it turned out, was a huge male that was kept away from the other elephants. He had a reputation for being hard to handle. John said I could have Albert as a gift. I immediately called the newspapers, certain that the news would make headlines. Just as before, the celebration to welcome San Diego's first elephant was a festive one. Festive, that is, except for Albert. When it came time to move him out of his private animal car, Albert proved that he had a mind of his own. We tried everything to budge him, but he just sat there. Finally, at one o'clock in the morning, we had to admit defeat. As quickly as I could, I phoned the newspaper to stop them from publishing the story, but it was too late. The newspaper presses were ready to roll. There was just enough time for the editors to insert the word almost at the end of the headline. The next morning, to my embarrassment, thousands of San Diegans opened their papers to read, The Zoo Receives an Elephant, Almost. We did finally get our first elephants, but Empress and Queenie caused a lot more headaches than smiles. We had hired a railroad baggage car to transport them to San Diego from San Francisco, but when it was time to load them in, Empress and Queenie protested. Then, when they were finally on board, they had a temper tantrum. They tried to yank out the window bars and tear the car apart. When the train finally reached its destination, we began to unload. Everything seemed fine until Empress and Queenie decided to stage a protest. Their long trip, which began halfway around the world in India, had been full of strange and confusing experiences. Empress and Queenie had apparently had enough. They simply stopped in their tracks on the loading platform. Like four-legged boulders, they just stood there. We did everything imaginable to get them to move. We talked sweetly to them, then we tried being stern. We pushed, and then we pulled. Nothing worked. They were statues of stubbornness. And then I remembered, Indian elephants were used to being ridden. Ready to try anything now, I climbed up on the back of Empress's neck and found that by gently kicking her, I could get her to move. I could even get her to go in the direction I wished by tugging on her ear. My helper, Harry Edwards, leapt up on Queenie. The same driving instructions worked for him, too. Feeling like cowboys, and also feeling pretty silly, we headed down the street atop our giant gray taxis. As our urban safari ambled toward the zoo, you should have seen the looks on people's faces. More than a few drivers slammed on their brakes when they saw those huge animals looming out of the dark. Finally, the zoo entrance came into view. A big crowd had begun to gather. By now, Harry and I were so tired that we thought we were dreaming, and the elephants were as exhausted as we were. We served them a hearty meal, then tucked them safely into their new quarters, and I let out a huge sigh of relief. I knew this was a story that I'd never forget.
What can you do to help save resources that preserve animals and their homes? Here's a good idea. It's called Cans for Critters, an aluminum can recycling drive that has been a big hit at the San Diego Zoo for more than 10 years. Did you ever wonder what animals at the San Diego Zoo eat? They eat a lot of the same foods that we eat. For instance, like human babies, young animals are often fed special milk formulas and fruit sauces. Their favorites include applesauce and mashed bananas. Do some animals eat foods you wouldn't like? Probably. Bears, for example, are given cod liver oil, which is rich in vitamins. What do koalas eat in zoos? Leaves, but only those of a few species of eucalyptus trees from their native Australia. The zoo's horticultural department conducted a two-year experiment to determine which species of eucalyptus was the healthiest for koalas and the best tasting. Then the trees were planted at the zoo. Now there's always an abundant supply of fresh leaves on hand. If you're lucky, you'll see the koalas eating the leaves one by one, but you're more likely to catch them sleeping, their favorite activity. Like most animals, koalas don't overeat and they only eat the freshest leaves, rejecting the old ones. In the wild, cheetahs chase down their food while running at speeds of more than 60 miles per hour. But since cheetahs can't hunt that way in captivity, zoos create an artificial situation that simulates conditions in the wild. In place of the live prey, like an antelope that the cheetah would normally hunt, researchers place a food bait that moves. The movement stimulates the cheetah's hunting instinct its appetite, and its feisty character. Cheetahs at the wild animal park are given food that resembles what they hunt in the wild. These carcasses are a challenge for the big cats because they exercise their jaws and teeth. Other fascinating animals to watch at feeding time are elephants. In the morning they eat alfalfa-based pelts, which contain all the vitamins and minerals that elephants need to stay healthy. For lunch and dinner they eat huge amounts of Sudanese hay. A full-grown adult may eat more than 300 pounds a day. They also eat browse, roughage trimmed from bushes around the zoo's grounds. Apples and carrots are a special treat, and sometimes in summer the keepers throw watermelon into their ponds. As with people, good dental hygiene is recommended for elephants. Zookeepers check the elephant's teeth for infections and to see if they're growing in, moving forward, or falling out. When elephants go looking for food in the wild, their tusks sometimes come in handy for digging, pulling up tender roots, and stripping the bark off trees. But while we enjoy watching the elephants, we shouldn't forget that they're threatened in the wild because of their valuable tusks. For years, people used elephant ivory to make piano keys, jewelry, sculpture, and other artifacts. It's now illegal to trade or sell ivory products in many countries, and new pianos are made with plastic keys. As a result, not as many elephants are being killed for their tusks. Wild elephant poaching, however, is still a problem. Worldwide, elephants are endangered because much of their habitat has been destroyed by human development. Their continued presence and the continued well-being of other animals on our planet will depend on people. We must preserve enough natural habitats for these unique wild animals to survive. There are thousands of animals to see at the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Wild Animal Park. This recording will help you enjoy them in a different way. For these are animal sounds. The zoo is quietest in the hour just before dawn, before the keepers, landscapers, and office staff arrive, while most of the animals are sleeping. It's the birds which break the spell first, tuning up to help orchestrate the morning. Soon, from all parts of the grounds come the sounds of animals waking and stirring, hooting, braying, growling, coughing, and in various other ways, voicing their impatience to be looked at. Before long, the day's routine has been established 
The animals quiet down somewhat, and the first visitors are admitted. When I made these recordings, I didn't know a Himalayan black bear from a, a white quilled black bustard, or a koala from a kookaburra. Some of these sounds are surprising, some are rare, some familiar, some may even be frightening. I was allowed to visit the gorillas in their sleeping and eating area behind the enclosure. These are lowland gorillas from Central Africa, and the female is nervous at having a stranger around. That's why she's making this aggressive sound. They're fed vegetables, fruit, milk, and dry monkey chow. The keeper's filling the dish now. And the huge silverback male, who weighs almost 450 pounds, is starting to eat. Acting just like any human baby, this three-year-old gorilla is upset because the others have left her alone. In the wild, these gentle, shy animals are actually hunted for souvenirs, and that's why they're an endangered species. Another of the great apes is the chimpanzee. Other members of the simian family include baboons. They're fiercely territorial and will challenge any intruder. Vast herds of hoofed animals roam Africa's grasslands. Antelopes, news, gazelles. In captivity, the young sometimes need special care. In the wild, they're left behind to become meat for predators. But here, they're hand-fed vitamins and baby formula by specially trained keepers. This baby black buck has just finished nursing. <laughs> This baby new is mooing at some children outside the nursery. And here's a baby springbok. The baby ostrich makes this sound to call to other chicks. When I recorded the African hunting dog, it had been separated from the others for medical treatment and was mournfully howling. And here's the white quilled black bustard. We talked about him before. You can hear him from anywhere in the zoo.
prowling and pacing in his rocky enclosure is a black leopard. But of course, no visit with the animals of Africa would be complete without a stop to hear the king of the jungle, the African lion. Now here's what's happening. It's feeding time in the early morning, and the keeper is opening the steel doors at the back of the exhibit. Here comes the male. And now, the lions. As I was moving a microphone, I accidentally got to within about a foot of the male, who objected. <laughs> the hair on my neck stood straight up. When they're angry or agitated, you can hear their roars echo throughout the zoo. I hope you've enjoyed this brief tour. These are just a few of the thousands of animals you can experience at the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Wild Animal Park. And next time you visit, maybe you'll look with your ears as well as your eyes. There are thousands of animals to see at the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Wild Animal Park. This recording will help you enjoy them in a different way. For these are animal sounds. The zoo is quietest in the hour just before dawn, before the keepers, landscapers, and office staff arrive, while most of the animals are sleeping. It's the birds which break the spell first, tuning up to help orchestrate the morning. Soon, from all parts of the grounds come the sounds of animals waking and stirring, hooting, braying, growling, coughing, and in various other ways, voicing their impatience to be looked at. Before long, the day's routine has been established, the animals quiet down somewhat, and the first visitors are admitted. When I made these recordings, I didn't know a Himalayan black bear from a, a white quill black bustard, or a koala from a kookaburra. Some of these sounds are surprising, some are rare, some familiar, some may even be frightening. of South America are home for many exotic and brightly colored birds, like the long-necked spindly-legged flamingos.
the Toco Toucan, with soft fur-like feathers and a beak nearly as long as his body. Here's a bird nearly everyone visiting the zoo has heard, the naked-throated bellbird. The oropendula makes a variety of sounds. Some of them don't sound like a bird at all. The only bear that's native to South America is the spectacled bear. He's black with lighter coloring around his eyes, just like spectacles. <laughs> These are dusky titi monkeys from Bolivia. Driving through the desert areas of the western United States, you might have heard the lonely howling of the coyote. Here, another one barks playfully with his keeper. Another native westerner, the rattlesnake. During breeding season, prairie chickens gather by the thousands in the plain states. The male is rather ordinary looking until he begins his courtship display. He sticks out his chest, spreads his tail feathers, drums his feet rapidly on the ground, and makes a hollow booming sound in his puffed up throat sack. The Galapagos Islands off Ecuador are home for 11 different races of giant tortoises. 
They can weigh up to 500 pounds, and they live to be well over 100 years old. Here's the sound they make during courtship and mating. Some of the most interesting animals I encountered came from Australia, including some of the world's most beautiful birds, like Leadbeater's cockatoo. The slender-billed cockatoo. The red-tailed black cockatoo. And the rose-breasted cockatoo. The huge flightless emu lives here. well as one of everybody's favorites, a sound I'm sure you've heard in countless jungle movies, the laughing kookaburra. This raucous cawing is the great gray bower bird. And this sweet plaintive song is the silver crowned friar bird. I hope you've enjoyed this brief tour. These are just a few of the thousands of animals you can experience at the San Diego Zoo and the San Diego Wild Animal Park. And next time you visit, maybe you'll look with your ears as well as your eyes. There are thousands of animals to see at the... Everyone loves koalas. They're cute, they're furry, and they're remarkably like the little teddy bears that we all knew as kids. So I was totally unprepared for the ferocious sounds that these marsupials are capable of making. <coughs> They live in eucalyptus trees, they eat only certain kinds of eucalyptus leaves, and they are jealously territorial. There's a female in the enclosure with this male, and that's why he's telling all the other males to stay away. Off Australia's southeast coast, 
is the island of Tasmania. And anybody who's watched a Bugs Bunny cartoon knows about Tasmanian devils. Yes, they really exist. And yes, they are fierce, carnivorous, and noisy. On New Guinea, the large island north of Australia, lives the cassowary. This large, flightless bird has a brilliantly colored head with an exotically shaped bony growth on top. <laughs> Further north are the countless islands that make up Indonesia, where the bulwar's pheasant is common. And the large Argus pheasant. and the Palawan peacock pheasant. In the jungles of Borneo and Malaysia, one of the most dramatic voices belongs to the Siamang, a primate, a large inflatable throat sac, which gives its call a booming resonance. <laughs> Of all the world's primates, one of the most graceful is the gibbon, a smaller cousin of the Siamang, which inhabits the jungles of Southeast Asia. The beautiful peacocks that roam freely in the zoo are called Indian blue peafowl. These regal birds with their spectacular tails were pets of royalty in ancient China. This unusual sound is a Himalayan black bear. Some scientists believe that the changes in tempo and in pitch are used to communicate. Madagascar, the large island off Africa's eastern shore, live red ruffed lemurs, small primitive primates.
On frozen islands close to the Antarctic Circle, we find black-footed penguins, also called jackass penguins, for obvious reasons. This braying call is usually made to attract females during the mating season. I've saved one of the most fascinating animals for last. Everyone has seen elephants in the movies or the circus or the zoo, but to stand up next to one of these huge creatures, to pat its rough hide and have its trunk sniff and touch you in curiosity was one of the highlights of this recording project. These Asian elephants have a tremendous variety of sounds. This female is lazily blowing through her trunk. When an entire herd gets excited, the sound can shake the ground. you a look at the backs of the cages that the keepers work while the visitors are here seeing the zoo. The windows that the visitors look through are at the front of the cage and the big double doors are at the back of the cage so that the keeper can reach in and work on these animals and do the things that he needs to do. The Fiji Island Iguana is an endangered species and we're very fortunate here at the zoo that we actually have bred them and raised up a couple of their young. We keep very accurate specimen histories on each one of our animals. Every animal has its own card where we keep a record of where it's at, what the temperature is in its cage, what kind of plants are in the cage, what kind of soil, what it's eating. Every three months we weigh these animals so that we can keep good track of what their weight is doing. If it starts losing weight, then we know that we need to either change its diet or the amount of diet it gets, or we need to consult a veterinarian. With reptiles, they don't show symptoms like mammals and birds do. They don't sneeze and uh, get droopy-eyed and, and look sick. And so we have to use the weight to do that. When you're working with something dangerous, the trick is knowing what you're doing. If you're experienced and you've been taught properly, you're not taking any chances. For some reason, possibly unexplainable, I found these animals so interesting. Maybe because they were so unusual and because they were so misunderstood. And the more I studied them, the more fascinating and wonderful that I uh, thought they were. And uh, I've been working with them ever since.